The path to your next big career move goes through Canada. The 12-month full-time MBA program at Queen's University's Smith School of Business features a proven team-based experiential curriculum built around the exact set of skills that top employers seek. The results speak for themselves. 98% of the class of 2021 accepted an offer for their dream role within three months of graduation. Listeners of the Touch MBA podcast can receive a complimentary virtual consultation by visiting yoursmithmba.com slash touch MBA. That's yoursmithmba.com slash touch MBA. Welcome to the Touch MBA admissions podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to? or how to get into the world's top MBA programs. Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, it's Darren, and welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. I got a lot of requests for a follow-up episode with this week's guest, Graciela Brewer, who I had on about two years ago. In that episode, we talked about how she got into Harvard Business School. Well, she's about to graduate from HBS in a few months, so I had to get Graciela on the show and ask her about her experience. What was it really like compared to her expectations before starting? How did she make the most of her time at Harvard? and what parting thoughts or advice she has for you, MBA applicants, on how you can best research schools and prepare for your intense two years. So I hope you enjoy this very open and candid conversation with Graciela. Remember, at touchmba.com, you can get free school selection help, upload your profile, tell us your career goals, and we'll give you our best advice on which schools might fit you best and where you would be competitive at. All that is at touchmba.com. All right, so let's get to my conversation with Graciela. Here we go. Back by popular demand. <laughs> is Graciela Brewer, who was on our show two years ago. I believe it was episode, let me check here. What episode was it? Episode 163, How I Got Into Harvard Business School. And I'm thrilled to have her back on the show because I kind of like twisted her arm at the end of that episode to say, you know, Grace, you're going to come on, you know, in two years, right? And, and I got her to say yes. And uh, so I followed up with her. And of course, Grace, being the person she is, said, oh, I'd love to come back on the show. So I'm so excited to hear about her Harvard Business School experience. I know many of you have written to me about a follow-up episode. So here we are. And I hope, you know, through, through Grace's uh, experience, we can learn a lot about HBS, what it's like to get an MBA in the middle of a pandemic, and more. So Grace, welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. And to clarify, you didn't have to twist my arm. It was a great experience last time. And I'm, you know, I'm excited to talk more about it. I've uh, had a lot of people, you know, you mentioned some people reached out to you for a follow-up. I've had a lot of people reach out to me just for conversations through LinkedIn, whether that be just, you know, sharing some messages or even getting on calls. So, you know, I've also gotten to gain a lot from this and meeting some great people on their MBA journey as well from doing this. Amazing. So I, I, I'm so excited for this. So let's just start with, you know, experience versus reality. You had this vision in your head. You got into, you know, one of the top, if not the top business school in the world, in the United States. And now you're like, I'm so excited to go to this program. Now you're almost done with it. So what has really stood out to you there? And I want to leave it, I'm leaving it intentionally very open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think for me, I, I didn't have super specific expectations. I touched on this when we spoke last time. I, I didn't know anybody who'd kind of gone through the program. Everything I knew was really from just on the ground research of being able to talk to people through the clubs and being able to see from through the website and things like that. And so I think I kept my mind pretty open going into the experience because of that. And I think that across the board, you know, just at a very high level, very happy with my experience, very happy that I decided to go to 
business school to pursue my MBA. I'm happy with my decision to go to HBS. And another layer of this for pandemic times is I'm also happy with my decision not to defer. I think mm. that that ended up being the right choice for me as far as timing wise. Um, because looking back at Harvard, it was one of the business school programs where you were allowed to defer, which was was pretty rare. And, you know, I think along those same lines, although I am really happy with it, uh, definitely has been a tough journey at times. So I'll try and be pretty open and honest about Great. the things that maybe didn't go as smoothly because, you know, in talking to prospective students, I think that when I can be a little bit more vulnerable about things, the good and the bad, that tends to have a pretty powerful response from people who are trying to decide if this is the journey for them or how they want to tackle this journey. But I think some things uh, that stick out to me that are of note when I think about my experience versus uh, what the expectation was, perhaps. I think there are some things that for the MBA program in general, not just at HBS, but you know, whichever school you decide to go to, are there's some baseline truths. There's things that you're going to hear over and over again that I think were very true for me and true for all my mm. classmates such as that it's very time consuming. Uh, there's a lot going on. You know, you're trying to prioritize. It's a really busy time period. Um, there's a there's a fair amount of stress as you're just trying to figure it all out. Mm. Um, and so if anybody has talked to current students already, I'm sure that they've heard that same sort of refrain. And I would definitely agree with that. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's just you're trying to accomplish so much in the two years and make the most of the experience. And the schools also are trying to give you so much to experience yeah. within those two years. And so, you know, how you handle all that and what you prioritize that that's always a bit chaotic and a little bit uh, tough to figure out, but everyone eventually figures it out. As far as things that are a little bit more personal to me, I would say that there's certain things that I expected to be hard that were easier than I thought. Mm. And certain things I didn't expect to be hard that actually were more difficult than I thought. And so some of the things that I, I thought would be pretty hard was uh, for me and specific to HBS, I was really nervous about the case method. I'm somebody more introverted. I, I don't love speaking up in front of a crowd. And I knew that, of course, going to HBS, that that was going to be an integral part of the experience. But I actually wanted to push myself, which was part of why I, I chose yeah. HBS. And I expected to be uncomfortable with that situation for longer than I was. But I think the fact of the matter is, like, you end up spending so much of your time doing cases and having case discussions that it becomes second nature pretty quickly. Mm. And so that was something that uh, I thought would be hard, but really ended up being something that you get the hang of pretty quickly. Another thing that I thought might be kind of difficult was coming from a non-traditional background, not coming from a school or a place of work that anybody would have known of prior to HBS and was really nervous about, okay, how am I going to feel compared to my peers? And you know, what, what's my standing? Am I going to feel confident in, in speaking yeah. up in class and those sorts of things? And I think so quickly you realize that everyone here is intelligent. Everyone here has like a different type of comment to provide to the class discussion and different perspective and things like that. And so that also is something that fades into the background. I sometimes I'll be hanging out with my section mates and I'll realize like, oh, I completely forgot like where you even went to college, <laughs> even though I know they've told me five times. And of course, it's a piece of information we know about each other, but it's just so non-important and just kind of fades into the background of just mm. getting to know everyone. So that was another area that I think really just was worry that I didn't need to have in whenever it came to the reality. As far as some of the things that were a little bit harder than I anticipated, I do think with HBS being so on campus focused, living off campus was a little more of a challenge than I realized. I didn't mm. kind of foresee how quickly things are just people are clumping together and activities are being planned. And even before orientation started, people are kind of on campus and they're all hanging out at, at the Schwartz Pavilion, the, like the little outdoor area and things like that, and already kind of grouping up and getting to know one another. And in my case, I didn't have an admitted students weekend because of the pandemic. So I also didn't get some immediate inroads through that. So I think kind of that, that mm. quick pairing off, especially mm. being somebody married and with a family was mm. much more difficult to navigate than I expected. And along those same lines, I think you realize how different it is from undergrad in the fact that there's, everybody's in a very different phase of life here. It's different than when an undergrad, we're all 18, we're all kind of, you right. know, young and dumb and trying to figure <laughs> it out versus, you know, everybody's coming into business school with a different perspective. Some people have 
been living mm-hmm. that like single city life and they've never cooked a day in their adult life ever. And then other people are like making five course gourmet meals in their own <laughs> homes before this. So I think just also navigating that was a little bit more difficult and something that, you know, you don't really think about until you're here and then mm-hmm. it feels obvious. Mm-hmm. Okay. So of course I got to dive into some of those responses. The the idea of being an introvert while at HBS, I mean, I I don't consider myself an introvert. I'm probably closer to an extrovert, but that that makes me nervous just saying that out loud. And you said you just kind of get used to it and it becomes second nature, but like with everyone in your section, all their eyes on you and the professor cold calls your name and you're ah, ah it's actually like you know, w- w- take me in between the becoming second nature. I mean, were there things that you found helpful, you know, to sort of have less anxiety or have no anxiety? Yeah, I mean, I think that HBS is pretty intentional with the section experience. They've really made that be such an integral part of your first year because you, yes, everybody's eyes are on you, but it's the same eyes over and over again. And there's a little bit of uh, less of that fear because it's the same group of people. In my case, it was 75 people in a section and normally it's 95, but you know, you, you spend every school day with those same people and you've heard their comments a million times. You've talked to them outside of class a million times. And so there, there's a little bit of comfort in that. I think, uh, you know, jumping from class to class with a whole different group of people then mm. yeah, probably would have been harder to ramp up, but they're pretty intentional with that for that exact reason. You kind of create a bit of safety. And I also started on Zoom, which I think made it a little bit easier. You know, raising mm. your virtual hand was a little bit easier to swallow right off the bat. But I think it, like I said, it's just, you get the repetition in and it's not just about speaking up in class. It's that you kind of figure out how to read a case. You kind of figure out how prepared you should be for a given case or given class. You know, if it's a leadership class, it's like, yeah, we're talking about high level soft topics. We're probably just going to read the case once and you're fine versus, okay, this is finance class. I should probably double check my model and make sure that I'm like ready to go if I get cold called. And so you kind of learn things as far as how you want to prep your cases. And I think you also learn even just the nuances of when you want to participate. And so you, you kind of figure out just the way that the classroom functions and, Mm. okay, well, I just spoke last class. So I probably am not going to get randomly cold on three times, cold called, you know, uh, in this next class or something like that. And you kind of figure out, um, you know, for instance, one of my section mates, she says, okay, I always prefer to speak at the beginning of class because I know I can't focus until I get my comment in. And then I'm the complete opposite. I'm like, I, if I speak at the beginning of class, then I'm so relieved that I just don't feel I'm defined that I don't even listen the rest of the class. (laughs) And so I think you just kind of figure out what you're comfortable with. And uh, you realize that there's different types of comments. There's like case fact comments. There's like calculation comments. There's, you know, let's discuss the high level topic at the end of the class sort of comments. And you just kind of start to feel all of it out and it feels a little bit more natural. Gotcha. Gotcha. And and would you say also being an introvert, because you mentioned one of the things you didn't anticipate to be difficult was the quick pairing off and kind of the different places people are coming from compounded by the fact that you're starting the program online. So I'm wondering how you found your groove in terms of uh, classmates you could really relate to and get to know or were interested in. How did you bond with them? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I was, I really was like, oh, I'm an introvert. So the case method's going to be hard. And then didn't think about the social part as much. And then it ended up being the total opposite where it was like, oh, the case method was totally fine. But I think that the the social part ended up being a little bit more difficult than I anticipated because, you know, I, I'm not the person that can be in a room with a hundred people and just feel super mm. at ease and just feel like I'm so comfortable rotating around having small conversations with everyone. Mm. Um, you know, that that's definitely not where I feel the most secure and where I feel like I get to know people the best. And I think to my earlier point that I'm glad that I didn't defer. I I do think the pandemic kind of worked in my favor in that way, in that we really were restricted to smaller groups for a lot of the first few months of the program. And so there was a lot more opportunities Mm. to get to meet people at small group dinners. Like there, you know, the whole first semester was just a lot of rotating of, okay, hey, let's have a random pairing of six people in our section that we can all just get to know each other because we can't, we can't all 75 of us get together in some sort of gathering in the middle of the pandemic pre-vaccine. And so I had a lot of space to be able to have those more intimate conversations with people, which is where I personally feel a lot more comfortable. 
And those were but like do... virtual dinners or real dinners? No, we were, yeah, we were allowed to be in real dinners if they were like groups of six or less. So, and to got it built to build on that, like the restrictions during the pandemic were very frequently reflected, like what our actual COVID positive rate was because we got tested two to three times a week for free. Wow. That was like part of you know, going here was that you had to be able, if you were going to be on campus, that you had to adhere to the testing schedule. And so it wasn't just like, oh yeah, you guys can meet up. It was something that those restrictions throughout all of my two years here have constantly fluctuated depending on what's happening with COVID situation and testing has always been an integral part of that. But yeah, so I think that being able to to meet in those smaller situations was was very helpful. I think if my first introduction to HBS was kind of the typical large scale parties that happen in a normal non COVID year, that would be probably a lot more difficult for me. But I will say that I think I've gotten better at kind of figuring out where I feel most comfortable and who I feel most comfortable with each semester that I've been here. I feel like each semester has been Mm. better than the last for that reason, because I've just kind of slowly been able to carve out the people that I feel like I meshed with the most and the areas where I feel most comfortable. I mean, would you mind sharing what, what, what those areas are? Yeah, I mean, so I'm part of like the Mamba, so like mom and BAs group here. And so that's like a really nice space to be able to totally. occupy, to be able to talk about motherhood and talk about some of those things because student moms are about 1% of the population here. <laughs> um, and that's sometimes it's less than that. And so that is a really unique experience. But honestly, I think just the way that I found my people was that I was able to just say, okay, who's okay having a Saturday night? watching a rom-com in a living room and not necessarily (laughs) having to like take a flight somewhere or like be doing like the coolest thing ever. Cause like full disclosure, I'm not very cool. And sometimes I just want to be chill. And, you know, I think it's a balance. Sometimes I do want to go out even being Uh, a mom and stuff. I'm like, I want to go out and have a good time, but that cannot be my 24 seven. And so I think just really being able to take stock of the people around me and say like, Oh, that's another person who's able to just chill out sometimes. Like let's be chill together and watch 13 going on 30 or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this whole idea, you know, I read this book that I'll I'll reference a few times in my conversation. It's called like MBA coffee chats and it's written by this like Stanford and Kellogg grads. And they say that one of their keys to their experience was valuing Jomo, the joy of missing out over FOMO because Otherwise it's just too much, but, but yeah, I mean, on on that note, like I'm wondering, uh, I'd love to hear about, you know, what you found most valuable from, from your HBS experience, you know, what has been your favorite part of the program and what have you found most valuable? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the biggest thing for me and like the biggest reason that I can so confidently say, I'm so glad I did this. I'm so glad I came here. I'm so glad I had this experience is I just feel like my concept of myself and what my future could hold is so wildly different. Wow. You know, I, I remember having my first corporate job after school and coming from like a working class, not corporate background thinking, Oh my goodness, I I can't believe that I'm my, this is my first job out of school and I'm making this much money, which to be clear, it was not six figures. It was not like anything super crazy. You know, I would say it was pretty standard for a software engineering post undergrad sort of role, um, which is good. But, you know, once again, it's not like I was breaking into some really cutthroat finance background or something. But, and I remember even my few years after that thinking like, oh, wow, I can't believe I get to travel like for part of my job. I'm so lucky. Like, this is so crazy. Like maybe someday I'll be in like a leadership position at like a small company. Like maybe if I work really hard, like I can get to that. And I think since being here and just, you see how much (laughs) everyone here has accomplished. Um, And I, I don't necessarily just mean like fellow students who are maybe entrepreneurs or have done really great things, but, you know, professors who have all this amazing experience or speakers who come on campus and, you know, you're reading every case and they do this kind of silly thing where, Next to anyone in the case, the company's about who went to HBS, then in parentheses, it'll be like, oh, so the CEO of blah, 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 parentheses, HBS 91. (laughs) And so, you know, you kind of see all of these different things that these MBAs have gone on to do and just how powerful this degree is and how powerful this experience is. And I think it's just kind of 
removed the ceiling that I had placed on myself of what I could potentially do. And so the idea that, oh, maybe mm. one day I could start a company and like I I could maybe do it. Like that's a really exciting idea. Or maybe one day if I, you know, really do work hard and pursue my passions, then I could end up in a C-suite. Like, you know, why not dream big? Why not think bigger? Um, And so I think that's the number one thing for me is it's just when I think about my future, I think about it in a completely different way than I did before the MBA. Wow. That's so inspiring. I mean, is is that, is is it the totality of the entire experience or is it like, you know, classmates or, I mean, yeah, I, I, that's, that's, that's just really exciting. I, I, I don't really have a question. I just think that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. I think it is the totality of, of the experience. Yeah. You know, you just, you hear what other classmates have done and how, you know, they've already started their own company or done something really amazing. Or you just, you know, your professors who you're having a coffee chat with is talking about how, you know, some major company that they were the CEO of or some amazing nonprofit that they started that has had this amazing social impact. You, you just are surrounded by people who have been able to do these great things. And I think it just helps you realize that, you know, why, why limit mm. yourself and the things you're passionate about? Yeah. I mean, would you say thinking of kind of uh, your classmates who have really exceeded at HBS or gotten the most out of the experience, like who do you think would not be a great fit for HBS? <laughs> Wait, sorry, phrase that again? <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. Who, who, who do you think would not be a great fit? at HBS. You know, you um, think there's a type of person that you know would just kind of struggle a bit more or not really fit in? So I don't know if it's about not fitting in specifically, but I do think that and and I've told this to some prospective students that I've talked to, if there's something like really tactical that you're trying to train for for your next job out of HBS, I would say HBS probably isn't the best place to do that. And I think that's from the admission of HBS as well. They put a pretty big focus on the fact that they're a general management degree. Yes. But I the way that I describe it is you're having a lot of these like very high level conversations and you're really just trying to get this like well-rounded leadership perspective. And honestly, that perspective probably isn't going to be super directly applicable in the next five years. Like it's probably going to be something that's better setting you up for the long term and being somebody who considers a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different types of information and has like a pretty well-rounded overall business knowledge for whenever you are a high level decision maker. But I would say, you know, if you're somebody who's trying to pivot into product management and you want to know everything you can about how to be the best product manager in the world and like what, what the exact skill set is for that, mm. there's probably other programs that you could go to that would have a little bit more of that, that hard hitting train me for this specific job sort of thing. Um, and so I, that's usually the first thing that comes to mind whenever I think of maybe if HBS wouldn't be a fit for someone, I think those types of career switches or somebody who's looking for something a little bit more in the weeds like that, it's probably not a great fit. That's great. And what about what about uh, the field experience? Where did where did oh. you end up going? Yeah, like, and <laughs> if, if you wouldn't mind walking me through how the pandemic affected that as well, right? So easy answer is I did not get a field experience. What? So, I thought it was like so. Yeah, I, I I can provide a little more color <laughs> on that. So during normally that's something that happens during your first year. You know, you you have this yes. project and then the second semester, you're I think you're working on it throughout the first semester and then second semester, everyone gets assigned to go to a different global location. So it's normally called field global immersion. That was really just not on the table for us at all for our first year when you consider the fact that we didn't even have vaccines for the first semester. So they're not going to send us globe trotting all over, um, which was totally fine. But going into our second year, what they set up was that it was structured a little bit differently. They had a lot of different field classes you could sign up for that all had some different topics and different locations. And anybody who wanted to be able to get that sort of global experience was able to. And so they opened up a lot of different locations and they were very clear from the beginning that this is very COVID dependent. Um, So (laughs) buy refundable tickets basically. And so those were supposed to happen in January at the end of our winter break. And it was, you know, December when Omicron was spiking and they had to cancel all of them. So unfortunately, I did not get a chance to have a, a field oh. global experience with my HBS degree. But, you know, I, I completely understand where the school's coming from on that one. It's a really big 
liability for a lot of different reasons, whether that's getting COVID itself or potentially trapping students when regulations and restrictions for different countries change. Yeah, I mean, and so, I mean, that's kind of getting to the heart of what I wanted to ask about it, having this sort of hybrid program and parts of the program that, you know, due to no nobody's fault, just weren't able to, to, to go, right? Weren't able to happen. Like, has that been tough for you and your classmates? I mean, this is such a unique time. Yeah. So just to provide some background for like last year versus this year. So last year we were allowed to come to campus and most people did almost, let's say 95% of people did come to campus right at the start of our first year. Um, a few people decided to stay remote a little bit longer, but, you know, we were allowed to come where, we like I said, there were restrictions placed on how we were allowed to gather and kind of what the, the off class social programming potentially looked like um, what clubs were able to throw was pretty restricted and we started off completely remote so totally on zoom until indigenous people's day so october and then we were able to move into hybrid and the way that that worked is we kind of had a rotating set of 20 or so students who would be able to be spaced out in the classroom that normally holds 100 students and so we had hybrid for a while then cases spiked we went back to virtual and then all of the second semester my first year we were able to do hybrid And then this year, going into the second year, I've been able to have all of my classes completely Mm. in person, full Mm. class sizes, but with masks on. And uh, that has not been the case for some of the first years because they were having a little bit more spikes in cases. But for our second years, our COVID cases have been um, good throughout the entire time. So we've been able to be fully in person, which has been great. And so I think that I have definitely gotten a very full HBS experience, especially since I've now throughout this whole second year had the complete class experience, I feel like, other than yeah, having a mask on, which is completely fine. Yeah. And so I've been able to experience, you know, a, a full case discussion with everybody in person, been able to experience my professors in person and things like that. And so I think from the class side of it, have been very happy with it. And I think if you frame this whole journey and the fact of, okay, through nobody's fault, we are having a subpar business school experience compared to other people. And that feels unfair. Then yeah, I think it's easy to get upset or get mad about it. But honestly, the way that I frame it is when it comes to living through a global pandemic, we are some of the most privileged people and have had such an amazing pandemic experience. And I don't even mean privilege from a place of money specifically. I'm talking about having access to tests and being able to have that peace of mind to test frequently, being able to safely get into social spaces with other people in small groups and things like that. So many people did not have that throughout this pandemic. And so I feel like I have nothing to complain about, honestly. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And and so my last question kind of in this section is like, you know, is was there any, could be academic experience or student club or I don't know, anything that you just were thrilled about that you really enjoyed that maybe isn't on the website or, or, you know, brochure, not many people know about? Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll shout out two things here. So I'm part of the leadership for Lasso. So Latino student organization, and I just really love getting to help that cause and help other mm. people of Latinx descent feel like they have a community at HBS. And so I was pretty involved even before I got to campus. Like I had already talked to like the presidents and I had already been able to, to meet some of the members whenever I did go on campus for my interview and things like that. During admitted students weekend, they had a ton of programming. So even before I got to campus, I felt like I was a member, even though I wasn't officially a member yet. And that was part of what led me to want to be part of the leadership and So that's something that's been really rewarding that I've been really happy to be a part of. And this, in my second year specifically, I'm VP of admissions, which means I get to talk to more prospective students. Whoa, VP of admissions. (laughs) Trust me, once you get to business school, you realize that every person in every club has some sort of leadership title. It's it's really not that impressive. But really, it just means that I get to talk to prospective students, which is something that I, I do love doing. And it's just, it gives me energy to feel like I'm potentially helping people and giving them information that could maybe make their their pathway to the MBA a little bit easier. And then the other piece that I'll talk about is the socioeconomic inclusion task force, which I think stands mm. out to me when mm. I think of what you were saying of something that's not necessarily evident from just looking at the Harvard website. So that's something that was started a few years ago 
um, and it was student led. And they started off by just doing this really in-depth research report about all of the different socioeconomic factors that affect students whenever they are attending HBS. And so that's things from like the social aspect of how it can be a little bit difficult if you're from a lower socioeconomic background, as well as, okay, the way that we talk about different topics in class, the way that our financial aid is structured. So really looked at it from a lot of different perspectives. And uh, last year, I was also part of that and got to learn more about how they were taking those results and how they were making sure that that was turning into action and working collaboratively with the administration to figure out, okay, how do we address some of these things? What what are realistic ways to tackle some of these problems? Because that's just another thing that I'm really passionate about. Yeah, I mean, let's let's dive into that a little bit. So a quote from the book I mentioned earlier, you know, these two gentlemen said, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I have the quote right here. They said, schools like to champion the diversity of the student bodies they create. However, socioeconomic diversity will likely be sorely lacking. And uh, many of your classmates will be wealthy. Be mindful of the blinders this creates. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't disagree with the, the knowledge there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think, it's, I, I think it's a hard thing to navigate. I think that the, and a lot of people say this, for HBS in particular, of course, there's kind of a stereotypical, like really wealthy, snobby sort of mm-hmm. perception that some people are fearful of um, and that that's going to be what it's like whenever you're here. And I would say for the most part, that's really not true. I think what it comes down to, and I like the way that that quote just put it, is the blinders mm-hmm. that sometimes exist yeah. whenever people come from pretty wealthy backgrounds. And so I think that most people here really are nice and well meaning. But sometimes it just comes up in conversation in ways that you realize that their experiences are just so vastly different than yours. And so whether that's, you know, mentioning vacation homes offhandedly, like that's just an expectation of everyone's existence or, you know, kind of the way they're referring to salaries and like the scale of that and what's normal and what's not normal. And so that can happen in one-off conversations that can happen in the classroom. And it is, I will say, a pretty difficult thing to navigate. Uh, Honestly, in some ways, I think it would be easier if it was like the stereotype of, oh yeah, they're really snobby jerks. And it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, well, those are mean people, screw them. Um, But that's really not what it is. It's that there's, you know, people here, like I said, who are really well-meaning and who genuinely do feel like good people, but then you're kind of trying to navigate like, okay, but how does that disconnect maybe from the average experience of American citizen or a world citizen, yep. like how totally. does that maybe going to impact the business decisions that you make? And how do we have like honest conversations about that? And then to the more tactical piece of like this work that the socioeconomic inclusion task force deals with, how do we not let those things be barriers so that people who do come from working class backgrounds actually feel comfortable in this experience? Mm. And so there's also just a lot of work that has to be done there. And I don't think that that work is specific to HBS. Mm. I think it's exists at a lot of top business schools, but I think it's something that we just have to start holding ourselves more accountable for. Um, and I've, throughout my experience, have just been pretty honest about the fact that I do come from a working class background and the ways that that's kind of impacted my experience mm-hmm. and the, the way that I've gone through this program. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That, that I mean, it sounds like two amazing um, like club, like the cl- lasso club and, and the task force you on sound, sound great. And I just feel like, I mean, living abroad, it, it's just, yeah, it's just kind of stunning to see. And uh, even within the U S I'm sure you see it as well, but like, I mean, that's where business is, right. I mean, so, so many people aren't, you know, the quote unquote elite or the quote unquote wealthy. So like just from a learning about business perspective too, I feel like it's super useful to have a mix of people. Anyhow, um, so let's, let's now talk about making the most of, you know, your HPS MBA. So some, some topics we kind of threw around before, you know, our conversation were, Managing priorities, health and well-being. And we know from our last conversation, you have a family. So that as well. How did you do that? Carefully? I don't know. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, Yeah, I mean, to be brutally honest, I think one of the, the main things I would say is just take your mental health really seriously while you're here. I think that it's it's really easy to think that 
oh, it's business school and everybody's having an amazing time and it's so carefree and, you know, it, it's, it's like the best time ever. Hmm. But I think the reality is, you know, here people are making a lot of tough decisions about their future and people are, you know, they're making tough decisions about what's going to make them happy in their careers and how much risk they want to take in their careers, what relationships they, they maybe want to continue or don't continue. It's, it's very much a transitional time. And even though I think on the surface, it can appear like everything's amazing. And I will say there's amazing things here. It is fun, but there's also a lot of people who are having, you know, really deep introspective <laughs> moments with themselves. And I think yeah. whenever I've had the chance to have more honest conversations with people about that, it's it's been really rewarding to just kind of take off the facade. And, you know, I personally being, like I said, being an introvert and kind of struggling with social anxiety. And that's just something that I've always struggled with. You know, I have found a therapist in the area, but I also know at least half a dozen people off the top of my head who also did in this experience. And that's not to say that it's like a terrible experience. It's right. just, you know, you're making a lot of important choices about your future. And so I think taking your mental health seriously in whatever that way, way that mm. means for you and, you know, sharing that with others, if need be, is something that's really important. And, you know, just having honest conversations about that. Mm. And so I think that's the number one thing that like, isn't, isn't a very glamorous answer, but I think it is really important. And I've just been shocked by how many other people have, you know, also kind of put that on the back burner to their own detriment. And then when you finally do actually figure out how to manage that self-care, it becomes a lot easier. Mm. Yeah. And and how did you navigate kind of bringing in your partner um, into the experience? And yeah, I think for me, um, it was one of those things that he is, he's also very introverted. So sometimes it was a little bit hard, but HBS actually is like a very, very partner friendly place. So I, I think I've, I've heard just some anecdotes from people who have gone to other, like have partners who've gone to other business schools and kind of hearing other sort of uh, stories that they've shared about it. And I think that's actually something that HBS really does excel at. It's you're part of the section, you're part of HBS, you get your own HBS ID, hmm. you know, even recently you also get access to the testing, which is, you know, an amazing thing to be able to include partners and families with. And so I th there's a partner's club. So that's something you can do. But I think it's also just if you're invited to something, it's usually pretty much implied that your partner can also come, which is really Got great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think that with us getting closer to like gender equity, as far as the, uh, you know, split at HBS, it's also nice because there's a good amount of male and female partners. And so there's opportunities for both. I know I was a little yep. bit worried about that of, you know, how involved like male partners and things would be. Um, but there's lots of great male and female partners here at HBS uh, that have been nothing but super welcoming. And I think there's also a good stratification of different types of partners, maybe who are stay at home versus those who are working full time mm -hmm. and things like that, which is also just scheduling wise, an important thing to consider. Cause if it was all stay at home partners, then, you know, daytime activities wouldn't really work for people who are working full time and vice versa. So. Yeah. Okay. And I'll circle back to this, um, as well, but, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about your, you know, how you got your internship and yeah, let's first start with the internship. Like, how did that come about? Could you tell us what, you know, what you did and what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. So I did a non-traditional job search. I knew that I was going to be doing something in user experience design. And I knew that that was not going to be on the normal <laughs> job recruiting HBS website. And so I, I was pretty realistic about that from the start. I, I didn't put my resume in the resume book which is, I think most business schools do this, but they put together a book of all the resumes for a given class and they hand it out to their major employers. I didn't do that because I didn't think anybody was going to look at my resume and really understand what I wanted. And uh, I also didn't want to make my resume the very standard like Times New Roman format because I'm a designer and they told me I had to. And I was <laughs> like, well, I'm not going to do that. So, and Stick also, into your principles, <laughs> stick into your design principles. Exactly, exactly. And I also didn't do fall recruiting because I knew I wanted to be in tech and that's something that normally recruits in the spring. So I kind of just was, was pretty straightforward about the yeah. ways that I thought I realistically was going to get a job versus wasn't and didn't try and pursue all leads um, just in 
the, for the sake of my own sanity and for the sake of just, you know, being more efficient with it. And so what I did do is I was went out onto my own and was looking at lots of different job websites. I was looking up like every company I could think of that I was like, maybe I want to work there. Let's see what's on their careers page and really compiling a list of every sort of internship that I thought might work and that I thought might be a good fit and kind of was ranking them as like high, medium, low, as far as Mm -hmm. their potential fit for what I wanted to do. And I also had some backup. So ideally I wanted to be something more directly in design, but if I could be in product management and influencing a design team, like working pretty closely with a design team, that was also something that I was willing to do. So I was trying to be realistic just because I knew it was kind of an unexplored career search. So I just wanted to make sure I had options. And what I ended up finding was at Toast, which is a restaurant software company based here in Boston. Mm -hmm. They just went public in the fall and they had this design operations lead job and it was a full-time role. And I was reading the description. I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. This is why I got my MBA. Like, this is the type of work that I want to be doing. This is crazy. And so what I did was I submitted my resume and I added into the PDF, like basically a cover page because I didn't have a spot for a cover letter. And so I just added it on top of my resume and I was like, hey, so I know this role is full time, but this is basically exactly why I'm getting my MBA is to do this. I would love to be your intern. I'm also very self-sufficient and blah, blah, blah. Here's my argument basically of why you should let me be your intern. And so... I was able to talk with them and I was able to convince them to let me be an intern. Wow! And basically the way that we structured it was that I would be full-time intern for the summer, especially because this was their first time hiring for this role. Mm. So, so Mm. it was also like, it was all brand new regardless of who they were going to hire. And so they let me be their intern for the summer. And then I said that I would be willing to work 10 hours per week during the school year. And so I've been doing that and they've been really great through that as well. And then in the fall, they, after the summer, you know, we communicated and they were comfortable giving me a full-time offer. I was comfortable accepting a full-time offer. And so we were able to hash out all the details. So I've been uh, good to go and ready since probably October for full-time work again. (laughs) Amazing. And I'm sure the uh, HBS career office is super psyched too. You're probably one of the earliest (laughs) people who signed. Um, But, you know, take me back to when you were actually sending out your resume uh, so did you, was that through like a job board or was that through an alumni or? No, I mean, I, I tried a few different things. Like I said, a lot of it was me just sending out my own application. So mm-hmm. looking at the career sites for all these different companies and then being able to just apply on my own, basically. I, I did have a few instances where I, for instance, I talked to my section chair, which is basically the we call them kind of your homeroom teacher. It's basically the professor that kind of is is your go-to person for your section. And I was asking for her thoughts and she connected me with someone and kind of shared some different things she thought maybe I could do with my skill set, which was pretty cool and helpful to hear. I did have a few instances where I saw more on the product management side, maybe a role for a startup. And Mm -hmm. I kind of looked on LinkedIn connections and saw that maybe they knew somebody from Lasso. And so I, you know, reached out for connections in that way. But Predominantly, I would say it was more me independently applying for things. Yeah. And that's Toast was like an independent application. And so that's how that ended up working out. That's so cool. I love that. I mean, I, I just love the like how you went, you know, kind of kind of zag there. I mean, just to give our listeners an idea, like you had to apply to uh, how many companies to to, you know, get some conversations and interviews. Yeah. So I something I did not do intentionally, but I would very much recommend was I applied for everything kind of all at once. So it was over the course of like a weekend. And Mm. honestly, the reason that that happened is because as a designer, you have to have a portfolio and I was really putting off doing my portfolio. So as soon as I had my portfolio done, it was already pretty late into spring. So it's like, okay, I really need to do this now. So I sent them all out at the same time, but that actually ended up working out super well because then all of my interviews ended up being mm-hmm. very closely clustered together. And so yep. all of my offers kind of overlapped where I was able to turn down one thing because I already knew about another thing and was waiting on another thing. And so I kind of got rid of that uncertainty. I would say as far as volume, I applied to maybe like 20 or so yeah. places. Um probably maybe closer to 30, but I did end up getting, I think like eight different interviews and Mm. those all ended up resulting in different offers of some kind. And so 
That's a really, that's really good. I think I, I, that's amazing. Yeah. So I think having it clustered was just really helpful. And mm. I, I would say applying to more is also pretty helpful because if I had just seen that toast listing first, I, I would have applied to that and I would have been really excited. But I think having that interview after having had so many other interviews, it was just totally. easier to feel out what what questions to ask. You know, you kind of get back into the rhythm of interviewing, also just seeing for an internship because it's I don't know what a normal MBA internship salary is. Like, yes, there's some resources out there, but I was going for a very non-traditional role. So there's not really anything directly comparable. So mm. having some other offers in hand where I could make those direct comparisons for my skill set and what that's being valued at was also super, super helpful. Well, congratulations. That's that's <laughs> Oh, that's wow. Fantastic news. Congratulations on, on landing the offer with them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very, very excited about it. And, and one resource I just want to recommend to my listeners, it's called the, uh, the two hour job search. I don't know if you did, have you heard of that book? No. Yeah. So I, I had uh, Steve Dalton, the author on my podcast, he's from Duke, but he has this great process called lamp for, you know, basically generating a list of companies and then from that list, prioritizing them. But he has like a very specific recipe for like how to do it. And like the way you did it was ranking them one to three. Right. But he has like this whole process for that. And I highly recommend um, you definitely check out that book, but the essence of what he recommends and what you did is, is pretty similar. So well, two hours sounds like I could have saved myself <laughs> a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Sorry. One weekend instead of two hours now, no, but that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, congrats. So I wanted to circle back to your partner in terms of like, is, is he working in Boston and like, how did that all work out? Cause that's a big move, right? From Kansas city. Yeah. Yeah. We were really lucky with the timing of it. It was late summer and that's whenever he really keyed off his job search. And the position we were in was that the company we were at, he could have worked remote. So we knew that we at least had that security, but oh, to be clear, great. it was a Kansas city salary and the cost of living in Boston is much, much higher. And so that was by no means our ideal. And so he was still kicking off a job search. And so he did a similar thing where he was able to kind of cluster a lot of interviews together, which was really helpful. And he was able to start at a Boston-based company. And he started Amazing. the week that I started my orientation. So we wow. both kind of kicked off at the exact same time. And he's still at that company. And uh, so he... It honestly, though, it really didn't matter that it was Boston based because of the pandemic. He's been completely remote this whole time. And because they're a bunch of software engineers, they don't turn their cameras on. So everyone on his team is just theoretical to him. <laughs> but, you know, so that's funny. Ostensibly, if he had to go to the office, he could. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So, and, and so, you know, um, I just, my last question here is, <sighs> That sense of possibility you mentioned that has really changed in you. What what else has changed from going through this HBS MBA experience for you? I think that you you do get a real chance to just kind of sit back and really think about your life while you're here in a way that is is hard to do in the chaos of everyday life. And so I I knew going into business school that I wanted to stay in design. But I think really reflecting on what I care about and the things that I'm passionate about and the type of work that drives me, I feel even more secure in that, which is really nice. And, and some people it's the reverse. It's that they maybe think one thing and then they get pivoted on a new path and they're really passionate about that. So, you know, what my distinct outcome was is really not the point, but it's just more that you kind of have a chance to really think about what it is that you want. And I think that's pretty valuable. And I also just feel like I've gotten to learn a lot. I was the really nerdy person that came to business school, like really caring about the education part. And so I have been really grateful for that, especially coming in with a non-business background. I have, have learned a ton. And honestly, though, I will put an asterisk with that, that yes, I've learned a ton about business and that's really valuable. But my favorite things that I've learned have actually been from my like world history, global economics classes. Mm. I think that I've gotten mm. to learn about just the history of so many amazing countries in the world. And those have been my favorite classes, even though when I was taking those classes, the cases are really long. And I remember complaining a lot being like, oh, I don't have to read these super long cases. But I think afterwards, it was just 
an area that I had no knowledge of. Like, yes, I didn't have a business background, but I knew a fair amount about, okay, I know what a balance sheet is. I know what an income statement is. And I, I know at a high level what some of these terms are just from having been in corporate America. But I think getting to learn about other cultures, both from the classes themselves and from hearing from people who are from those countries in the classroom and hearing their perspectives on things. And then also in a few rare cases, getting to go to places like with people from those countries, like that cultural immersion piece yeah. also has been like incredible. That's awesome. And I mean, you still have a number of months left. What are you most excited to, to do? I mean, you, you got a offer and yeah, you're working 10 hours a week and now yeah, what are you super excited about to close out the experience? Uh, well, to be perfectly honest, I just recently signed my lease for after school. So right now I'm just envisioning my new apartment. That's what has <laughs> been driving a lot of my energy right now. Um, but no, I, I am really excited because I, for graduation, a lot of my family and friends are going to get to come here. And that's something that with the pandemic especially has not really happened too much. My parents helped me move here whenever it was August of 2020, wow. so very much peak pandemic. And my mom's gotten to visit one other time since then. But the fact that they'll get to come here and we'll be able to have graduation activities where I'll get to meet my section mates' families too and get to meet you know some of the important people in their lives. I think I'm much more looking forward to that than like the specific graduation ceremony itself. Like, yes, that's cool. And as of right now, we actually, knock on wood, do get to have an in-person graduation and we're the first class in a while to be able to do that. Wow. So I am very grateful. But I think the fact that we'll all actually get to celebrate together with a lot of the people that care about us and they'll actually get to view it. I think that that's probably the, the number one thing. And I'm sure my mom's going to cry. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, you know, finally, maybe we can talk about kind of advice to applicants, right? Because you know, you know who listens to this show. And so I think they'll have, I, I just appreciate your your openness with how everything has gone and, you know, what what's been great for you and what's been difficult. But, you know, what advice would you give to applicants who, you know, are researching and trying to shortlist schools and applying to schools? And let's start there. But part B would be, you know, what can they do to prepare as well, right, once they've gotten it? Those are kind of two questions I have. Yeah, I think whenever you're applying to schools, just talk to as many people as you can from each yeah. school. And I know that's pretty straightforward, but I think there's just... I talked to like a lot of people from HBS whenever I was applying and looking back, there's certain people that I can very clearly say like, oh, wow, your priorities in business school were just a lot different than mine. And maybe I would have viewed that conversation a little bit differently looking back at it now. And that's not to say it's a bad thing. It's just to say that if you talk to a lot of different people, then you're likely to encounter a lot of different perspectives. And then you can have a more complete picture when you're trying to make totally. a decision about the school. And so the more that you can do that, and once again, I know I said this in the last one, but I did not know anyone at business school. So anywhere that you can mine for people. So whether that's student, some schools have student ambassadors you can reach out to, or you can yeah. send emails to all the clubs. Like there's a lot of different ways that you can talk to people, even if you don't know people at that school. And then if you do know people, maybe don't talk to your friend who you've known for a long time, maybe talk to their friend who you've never met before, and they'll give you a different perspective as well. And I think that another piece of advice for applying would be, you know, figuring out your story is something that you hear a lot, but now having lived through the experience, you're going to need to know your story for about 60 other things once you get here. So if you can just do that now, you're really going to be doing yourself. Wait, what do you service. mean? What do you mean 60 other things? It's just, you, know, you have <laughs> to figure out what your story is for whatever you're applying but then you're going to meet a bunch of classmates who want to know the elevator pitch of what your life was before this. And then you're going to get interviewed for roles and they're going to want to know what your life is before this and what you want to do after. And then you're going to have, you know, lots of different places. We'll do like my takes, which is basically, uh, you know, different people will share their story at, on a larger stage with their classmates and things like that. There's just a lot of different areas where you are recounting what your life before this was mm. and what the meaning mm. of that was and what you want that to mean for your future. And there's also classes where you're asked to reflect on that and to speak to that and to learn from it. And so just realizing that there's just a lot of value in that, not just for the sake of getting in and applying, but realizing that that's going to be a pretty big part of your two years here is 
working on that story and understanding it and having that drive what your future is. So rather than thinking of it as an Mm. annoying checklist item for getting in the door, understanding that that's something that's helpful to reflect on now because you're going to have to keep reflecting on it. So interesting. So the story, it's, it's like the telling of your story, it's a lifetime skill. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and and that's not to say manufacturing, like your perfect clean story of that just looks like very picturesque and having it be fake. It's just, okay, figuring out whenever you are trying to really communicate who you are to someone, whether that's an interviewer or your new classmates, or like I said, a professor for a class assignment, what what do you think are the important things of what you've experienced so far? Like, what do you think those things Mm -hmm. mean for what you want to do in the future? And how does that all come together? Like, how can you help someone really understand that about you? Yeah, I love that. As a designer, I, I asked you, uh, how would you redesign the uh, MBA application process in our last podcast? So now I can say, how would you, how would you redesign the B-School experience? Yeah, I think two things come to mind as far as redesigning the business school experience. I, one, I wish there was more feedback. I think that... Really? Even at, that's interesting. Uh, that's surprising to hear, actually. Yeah, I think, and and it's so hard for me to tease out what is specific about HBS versus what might be applicable to other schools because the academic experience with case method is very, very specific. And so maybe what I'm about to say really does just apply to Harvard. But I think, you know, with the case method, you're, you're getting a lot of reps in, you're getting a chance to publicly speak a lot, and that's something that's really valuable. But you don't get a lot of direct feedback about how you're doing with those reps. And so I think having there's some feedback mechanisms that you do get that from your professors but i think something a little more fleshed out would be really helpful to kind of understand mm. what what you're doing well versus maybe where you can build on your your skills a little bit more and that's not just about the public speaking itself but the actual content of you know the way you phrase your arguments or maybe the things you tend to zero in on versus don't and i will say that professors are really open if you set up that time with them but i would i would love for that to be a more integrated part of the experience i think that there's a sometimes just a good amount of work that you do that you don't end up hearing very direct feedback from other than what your final grade ends up being totally and Full disclosure, your grade is a number one, two, or three. So that's not very descriptive. (laughs) And so I I think I would have loved to have more feedback throughout the process. I think that there's a lot of great feedback that we kind of build in by, okay, maybe one of our classmates is our comment buddy and we kind of help each other Mm -hmm. by giving each other feedback. But I think more formalized feedback in the academic process is something that I I would have appreciated a lot more. And then I think (laughs) just... A lot of business schools could maybe be a little bit more electronically, technologically advanced, (laughs) which I think is, you know, a pretty common complaint of most academic settings that they're not the most fast paced and early adopters for a lot of different technological advances. And I'm not expecting any crazy AI machine learning sort of sorcery here, but, you know, like a little less paper cases. And I know some of my classmates would not agree with that because they love having paper cases. But like every time I look at my giant stack of paper cases I've been given, I'm like, I can just use the PDF. Like Mm. it's fine. Yeah. No, I love those suggestions. Um, And I think that again, referencing that book, that was one of the biggest recommendations uh, those MBA grads had. And they were from Stanford and Kellogg too. So I, I, I do think incorporating the feedback at both the academic level, like you said, like one, two, and three, there's not much gradation there. Right. And, but what they did was they basically formed these intentional sort of weekly, like basically had these feedback partners where you establish kind of meta communication rules, right. Where it's like, okay, we're all trying to get better at what we're doing. So, you know, essentially don't, don't worry about hurting my feelings and let's just be honest with each other in terms of, what are our impressions of each other? They, they said that was really a big thing. Like what impression do you make at the beginning? How has your impression of me changed over time and stuff like that? So that's really interesting suggestion, I thought. Yeah, there is one class here that's a, a very popular class that I'm in now and would definitely recommend. It's called Authentic Leadership Development. And that I would say is the exception to this and that they are very big on offering that feedback. So you have learning groups that are very similar to what you just described where you're with your classmates and there's a lot of prompts that 
yep. make you actually have that honest communication about impressions yeah. and you know those sorts of things and it's it's a very fostering a very vulnerable open sense within that group but then also you post your own reflections to the professor and the professor responds to every single person in the class mm -hmm. and so that is one mm -hmm. class that I think that this does not apply to because they're really great about feedback in that class and making sure that each and every week somebody has read your musings and has actually <laughs> you know given you some thoughts and some things to think about and has actually taken the time to give that feedback, which I, I really appreciate. And it's one of the things I love about the class. Yeah. I mean, even now, like, you know, I've been working for a few decades and I still yearn and appreciate feedback so much. You know, I, I feel like it's so important. Last question, Grace, is just what, what didn't I ask that I should have asked? <laughs> I mean, we covered a lot of ground. But, you know, I'm just wondering if there's something, something else. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything that stands out. I, I do realize, though, that I didn't answer one of your previous questions because you were asking my advice that I would give to applicants applying and then also <sighs> advice that I would give to people who've been admitted yes. and how to prepare. So I, I, can, I can circle back on that one. Yeah, I mean, similar advice. Try to talk to a lot of people if you can. But I think also just really thinking about your choice of living on and off campus is, is a pretty important huh. one. And I think, like I said, that was something that was a little bit tough for me. Now in my second year I've, that I've kind of realized the balance, I'm actually really glad I live off campus, but it was a little bit tougher in my first year. And so, and some campuses that makes a bigger difference than others. Like on totally. HBS campus, a lot of people live on the campus versus other big metro areas. Maybe that's not going to be the case, but I do think that that's something that, that you should think about from your budgetary standpoint, but then also the experience standpoint and, you know, how you want to go about that. Cause I do think it, it can make a, a pretty big difference in what your experience ends up being. And I would also say, try to be pretty aware of how many things you want to get involved in and then subtract two. And that's probably how many <laughs> you should actually be involved in. So if oh, you have two. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like that, uh, that old fashioned quote where it's like, okay, you know, get ready and then take off an accessory. And that's how much accessory you should actually have on. But yeah, it's just as far as if you are the person who really wants to go all in and you're excited about all the clubs and you want to get involved in this and that, just be realistic that if you're halfway involved in a lot of different things, that doesn't really help anyone. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I, I, it was really hard for me, but I had some clubs that I really wanted to be in leadership for. And I was like, just don't, you can't do it. It's not going to be good if you do it. And I, I literally had written the emails saying like, yes, I would like to be in leadership, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I stopped myself from sending them. And I'm so glad that I did because, you know, you, there's only so many hours in the day and it's already kind of hard to figure out that balance. and. So don't make it even harder by picking on all of the things that you halfway want to do and all the things you really want to do. You've got to really kind of narrow it down to the things you actually think that when you're tired and it's the end of the evening and you roll back home that you're actually going to work on, <laughs> not the thing that you're going to keep putting off. Because nobody wants to be that club leadership member that never gets anything done. <laughs> yeah, we should call that the, uh, we should term that something like the Graciela ratio or something when you're tired and <laughs> you're at the end of your rope, what would you still want to like really give yourself to, right? And your skills too. Um, I mean, what was that, what was that end number for you in terms of clubs? So my, my first year I was the family rep. So each section has a little like cohort of leadership that they, they have. And so for me, I was a family rep. So that was something that was a little lower key, but I did get to throw some baby showers and do some other things for uh, new expected parents, which was fun. And I cared about, and then I was awesome. in lasso leadership both years. I am part of this like entrepreneurial fellowship thing. Mm. So, so basically you get partnered with just a startup to do a small project every semester. And then I was in the socioeconomic task force. Um, I'm keeping which, count. But to, to be fair, <laughs> I, I did have to drop one of those whenever I started this year, knowing that I would be working 10 hours a week. And right. I, the, I really wanted to be in leadership and design club, but that was the one that I chose to not send the mm. email so that I didn't indebt myself further than I could really work on. <laughs> Got you. Gotcha. So yeah, maybe like three to five things. Yeah. And honestly, don't feel guilty if you like don't want to be in club leadership. There's plenty of people here who just kind of want to 
hang out with different clubs and get free pizza sometimes. And that's totally fine too. Like if you don't want to be super involved in them, that's, that's fine as well. I'm just leaning towards my own experience, which is that I was way over excited about everything. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, so one thing I've kind of learned from, from our talk is that you really got to know the Lasso leadership and club very well before you, you, you know, arrived. And that also seems to me like a great way to kind of find your people or, or like get involved before you're in, before you come, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So I can definitely speak As to a, HBS. Right. As yeah. opposed to like, I mean, the on camp and just to be clear, I, I want to make sure I understand you correctly. If you choose to room on campus, that will help you kind of integrate and, 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 you know, find your click or find, you know, a group of friends quicker than living off campus. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, you are running down into the cafeteria frequently and you're running into people into and people. you're like, you're, oh. you're seeing, yep. oh, hey, there's, there's something happening in the lounge. Let me just go down there and check it out and things like yep. that. Yep. And so I think there's just a lot more of that. I don't think it's anything in, intentionally exclusive. I think it's just that you end up spending a lot more of that time with, with your classmates because of the proximity as totally. opposed to me where I'm for me to go on campus and having a 25 minute walk. So I don't just like randomly do that to go sit on a patio and maybe run into people, which some people do and that's fine. But also I have other things to do, so I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. But, serendipity is a big deal. I mean, which is really interesting with this future of work, right. And all of us working remotely and like how important it will be for, you know, just to be around the office and to bump into different people and hear what's going on and to meet people and form relationships and all that. But yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, I think it's just the proximity thing. And HBS is, has an actual campus. Some business schools are a little bit smaller and it's more of just a singular building, in which case that might not be as big of a deal. But with HBS, there's a lot of on-campus space and, you know, there's an on-campus cafeteria and there's dorms and it's, it's a whole little ecosystem in and of itself. Um, but to your earlier point, as yeah. far as Lasso being a good way to find your people, yeah, I'll say it HBS, Lasso and ASU both, and then also LATAM, which is Latin American Club, which is slightly different. They all have really strong communities. And so that's definitely, I know from myself and then other members of those clubs have reiterated that same thought of, yeah, I've definitely found amazing people outside of my section that I feel like I can relate to and that I have a bond with and that I feel pretty close to and have a community with. Because I think for all of those clubs, having a sense of community is a really important tenant of the club itself. Yeah. You know, cer certain clubs, it's like, oh, the wine and cheese club. It's like, cool, <laughs> we're just trying to have wine and cheese. But for those clubs and, you know, different affinity groups and things like that, it, having that sense of community is one of the things that they're driving towards in their programming. And that's definitely the case for us. And I would be willing to bet at a lot of other business schools, that's probably the case as well. So if you do identify with certain groups, probably reaching out to those sorts of clubs is where you might find a little bit more of that close knit community because there is just a lot of shared experiences within whatever that community might be. I think that's a perfect place to end. Graciela, thank you so much. Thanks for coming back on the show and, you know, reflecting on your year and a half. Uh, it's been a lot of fun and I'm sure it's going to help, you know, a lot of people, you know, as they think about HBS and other top schools. So thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so happy I got to come back and got to catch up. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Remember, you can get free school selection help and a profile review at touchmba.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.